when the diagnosis come along, we were not prepared for it. And it came from my wife just doing inquiries over telephone line regarding about how to assist Maya and with his social skills. And the person on the other line said um, whether she had another relatives. And we said, yes, she does. And she started describing my son, Eric. When they started describing Eric, the other person on the line started ticking a few boxes. Either she knew what autism was, or she just knew something about it. And she then recommended my wife to call a group, an autism support group. And that's probably the first time the autism came into my family. You have dreams for them, what they're gonna be when they get older, and it's very shattering when the reality hits. When the diagnosis started, we started spending a lot of money. From trying to move to North Sydney, in between the year, we started moving to Centrelink because we exhausted all our savings and we exhausted, exhausted whatever we had left. So I started working two jobs, one in daytime and one at night. I slept on my car and I only managed to see my family on the weekend, but I did not want to fail of being a provider. I did that for about six months and eventually you wear out, you get tired, you start getting bitter and angry and my marriage struggled. While my understanding about autism, it also struggled and what can I do for my own children, I struggle even more. But you know, you want to be able to hear your son's voice when he calls your dad or wants to give you a hug and that was taken, that was taken away from me. I couldn't, my son was non-verbal, he was severe in the spectrum in his own well. It made it very hard when you go around to birthday parties or you go to the park or you go to family and you can hear all the other kids saying, you know, daddy, dad, but I wasn't hearing mine. And my daughter being verbal, she kept asking me, what's Eric saying, daddy? What's Eric saying, daddy? And you become like a translator. You start telling her that she's saying, Maya, <coughs> your brother loves you. And your brother wants to play with you. But she has the right to hear her brother's voice. And I have the right to be called that. But autism took that away from me. And it was hard for me to deal with. But we put a lot of work and dedication. All those uni students that were in the room, day after day. We got scratch. Eric makes statements, he banged things. But we went past by it. We said, I'm not going nowhere. I know you're struggling and I'll be here to help you. I will be here to help you. We're gonna play and through play, and we're gonna build a connection and a trust and a bond. And that was in early 2014. About after doing a year of therapy in the rooms, one day I come from work, I went through the door, opened the door, and I saw my son on the couch lying down. And for that moment, from my peripheral, I could see me, he got up. I looked at him, and then he looked at me, and he just walked towards me. Like a natural instinct, I hit the ground, put my back down, he came to me, and I got hugged. But I swear that at that moment, I heard, I love you, Dad. Happy birthday, Dad. Merry Christmas. You are my friend. And don't give up on me. That's all I needed to hear. While the diagnosis still says that it's still a one and a half in the spectrum, severe in the spectrum, we don't focus on what the diagnosis will say. That's a starting point. We know where he, Eric is at. All those little goals are small, but they are meaningful. And we know that on those ones, we're going to build the skills they might need. So my children, today they're still going with the journey and I know it's gonna be harder, but I have learned that I gotta be there because they need me to be there.